Hi, Peter Walker here and welcome to today's edition of The Transition Guy. Now joining me today in the studio from Shanghai is Jamie Dixon, author of The Story Habit. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you very much for having me, Peter. Very good to be with you today. So, so I mean, I'm a great fan of stories. Mm. Really a great fan of story and storytelling. Mm. Where did where did your book come from? Well, you know, I work as a I work as a coach and trainer, um, doing a lot of leadership development programs. And a number of years ago, I I started getting requests for storytelling. Uh, it seemed it became quite a popular topic at at that time, and as I started looking into storytelling, um, you know, I came across a lot of things about things like the hero's journey, for example, yeah. which is a fantastic model for if you're going to write a, a fantasy novel like Game of Thrones. Um, but I was working with people who were tidying up their monthly reports uh, and trying to influence their stakeholders. And every time I thought about using the hero's journey, it just seemed to really overcomplicate things. So that set me off on a journey of trying to understand what do we really mean by storytelling? Because we use that word in so many different contexts and in so many different ways. And I came to the conclusion that we mean meaning. Um, uh, storytelling is the art of making meaning. And you can learn a lot about the art of making meaning from how stories do that. But you can also take, take those techniques out of stories and use them independently as well. And as I was doing my research even further, I also realized that um, storytelling is not just about telling stories. Much more importantly, it's about shaping the stories that people believe in. And that I think is the most relevant application for leaders. So now it's interesting what you're saying, because a lot of people, they probably read something like Donald Miller's story brand book. They've mm. heard about the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So they think, okay, let me tell you a story. But yeah. the reality is the story, and excuse my language, is shit. <laughs> not engaging, mm. but more importantly, probably not believable. Mm. And you said something there about shaping the story. I, don't, I mean, I know myself that that's probably something that I was never taught. I was mm. never taught how to shape a story. How does one go about that? Hmm. Well, what I mean by shaping stories people believe in is everyone has things that they believe are true that are not necessarily true. Right. And as an example, I work with a lot of Chinese leaders here in China, in Shanghai, and they work in international companies. And in the last two years in particular, with all of the political fallout um, that China has been going through on the international stage, that has been coming up um, in, in the training room. Uh, these people are directly affected by it. And as an example, a very specific example, was one European company that makes coffee machines. And the Chinese team wanted to start selling the coffee machines on the local Chinese e-commerce platform. But when they went to the European headquarters, the European headquarters were like, no, we don't sell our coffee machines on platforms that sell counterfeit products. Also, we have a website. So if anyone needs to buy something, they can go to our website. And what they failed to understand there is two things. One is that platform, yes, several years ago did sell counterfeit products, but it doesn't anymore. Mm. And secondly, um, no one uses websites in China. Just because they use websites in Europe doesn't mean they use websites over here. And so they have this story about, you know, it sells counterfeit products, don't want to be associated with that, and they can come to our website anyway. And it's just completely separated from reality. And so how do you work to influence the stories people believe in? And there's actually a lot of parallels between the process of telling a story and the process of shaping a story. And that there's three words that I, um, you know, that form the framework that I talk about in the story habit, which are relate, challenge, resolve. First of all, any story is always about the audience. And what, what you just mentioned there, sometimes the stories are really, are really shit. And that's because it's about the storyteller. It's not about the audience. 
when the story is about a person the audience can relate to in a situation the audience can relate to they immerse themselves in the story and then a challenge happens to that person and then they have to find a way of resolving that challenge and when it comes to working with the stories other people believe in what you have to do first is relate to their story relate to what they're believing in what their motivations are and it's only when you can relate to their story that you can start to challenge their story and point out what's wrong with it and resolve that resolve those issues by providing a better story for them to, to believe in. So it's that process of relate, challenge, resolve that I, I have found is the most relevant application for, for leaders in particular. So that's really interesting because when you, saw, when you start talking about the construct of that, a couple of people spring to mind that they do a phenomenal job with that. Patrick Lencioni with mm. his fables, but also Elia Goldratt has been another person that really used that construct extremely well. Mm. I, one person in particular uh, that comes to mind is actually Simon Sinek. Um, That's in his book. Yeah, and, and it's actually, and, and to be very, very transparent, I'm actually not a huge fan of Simon Sinek. I, I, think, I think he spends a little too much time in the relate territory and doesn't necessarily challenge his audience enough. He relates to what the audience wants to believe in, but doesn't really challenge them. But uh, I digress. I actually use an example of Simon Sinek in the book because there's, you know, there's a very famous talk uh, called The Millennial Question that went viral several years ago. And it's just such a perfect demonstration of relate, challenge, resolve. And you can see how the audience are reacting as he's going through. You know, he's talking about the experiences they've had and everything everyone blames millennials for and you can see the audience nodding their heads and he shows he understands them but then he once he's under he's once he's related to them then he challenges them and points out the flaws of being addicted to smartphones and so on and then in the end he resolves those challenges by providing recommendations on how to make small talk and and so on and he, he's such a great example of that and I would argue any great speaker, any great leader is really skilled at using that process because it's essentially speaking the language of the mind. Uh, and if you want to be a good leader, you have to be fluent in the language of the mind. Well, that's probably, you say the language of the mind, but that's probably something that doesn't necessarily come up in leadership training to say. Um, no, I mean, I've rarely have I ever seen a, a module that would say, mm -hmm. yeah, let's go down this route. So if people want to learn this skill, develop mm -hmm. this skill, harness this skill, how do they do that? Mm. Well, I would say, I, I, well, I'd say, I'd say several things. I, I think one is the reason we love storytelling and stories so much is because they are speaking the language of the mind. Well, good stories are speaking the language of the mind. And the next time, you know, if you want to learn about the language of the mind, the next time you really get immersed in a good story, maybe you're watching a really good movie, maybe you're even just hearing a friend share their story of what happened to them. The next time you really get immersed in that story, think about why, what's happening here exactly. And, and what is going on between the words that they say and what's happening in my mind? And, and there's a lot of things that you can, you know, a lot of different techniques that you can pick out from there. But going back to relate, challenge, resolve, think of it in that way. How is this person relating to me right now? Or are they relating? Did I lose interest when they stopped relating? And when did that happen? What is the challenge that they're talking about? And, and then what is the resolution and how did they present that? And I, I would say, if you want to learn the language of the mind, look at the stories around you that really grab you and think about how they actually grab you. And that's basically what I did for, for the story habit. And there's, there's so much to learn just by looking at stories. I mean, that's the one thing I probably would say that's drawn me to autobiographies. Is that I absolutely love the stories. Okay, not everyone's autobiography is necessarily going to be my cup of tea or something that I can necessarily relate to. 
but it's actually the stories that you learn from more than anything mm. else and the experiences that those stories sort of have led to absolutely and i'm i'm quite similar to you because i i actually find fiction very very hard to get into but i love i love biographies and i i'm actually fascinated by the uh the age of exploration uh, and i love reading accounts of explorers from that time and and the challenges they went through and i i i think it's so so similar to how story works as well the process of exploration because in a in a story we are introduced to a person who has their story about how the world works but then the world stops working in that way and they're without a story they're in unexplored territory and we then follow them on their journey of exploring this new territory to form a story to help them navigate it and that's probably why i'm so fascinated by by age of age of exploration there are so many really unique experiences that i would never get myself but i can learn from reading about their discoveries and it's not yeah and i totally agree and i suppose that then in turn teaches us to probably from a, as you said earlier from a leadership point of view instead of talking to people through statements and commands because that's basically what a lot of leaders still do mm. they they sort of bark out commands and they sort of manage through statements maybe there's an element there where you can lead through stories where you've given people context to situations so that they can actually deeply understand why we're doing stuff instead mm. of always focusing on the what needs to be done i would even go further as well and suggest that they look at the conditions that people are working under and you know right now we're witnessing the great resignation right now because people have spent so much time at home like i'm currently doing in shanghai right now and they their story has changed they've mm. realized it's possible for me to stay at home and i like staying at home i'd never spent this much time at home before and now i've spent enough to know i like it and the conditions have changed and so their stories have changed and i think when you're just asking people to give their time in exchange for money uh that's not really the kind of conditions to create a story that motivates them you really need to understand what they value and one of the things human beings all around the world value is autonomy and respecting that autonomy as opposed to forcing people uh, because when you force people to do things, you pressure them, you threaten them, um, you give them more and more stuff to do and less time to do it. Uh, that's a story of slavery in a way to them, and they're going to be disengaged. It is, but unfortunately, I would say that's probably the byproduct of industrial age leadership. So, mm. and, and again, I still think there's a big hangover where you've got leadership teams in their 50s and 60s. And, and 70s actually, and occasionally mm. 80s, where they'd been, where they'd grown up with that industrial age mindset. Mm. And times have changed, as you said, and they're still trying to rule on yesterday's operating system. Yeah. And, you know, I'd say as well, I, I, I don't necessarily blame them because we are human after all. And th that operating system that you described is built on so many layers of beliefs that are built on so many layers of experiences and reinforced through social networks as well and that there's so many pieces to the tower there it's a lot like a jenga tower uh, you remove one bit and the foundation weakens and the whole thing can crumble and people don't want that to happen so the more layers you have there the harder it is actually for people to change. And I think an implication of this actually is that uh, you need to throw yourself into change as frequently as possible, especially in the world we're working in right now, um, because we've just witnessed a massive change with, with the pandemic and all of the things that have come out of that. But there's so many other changes going on right now as well. Uh, and if you stick to one operating system, you're going to very much be out of date <laughs> very, very fast. Yeah, you know, and that sort of sparks a thought, perhaps, that 
there's a huge emphasis on people on learning all the time. Mm. I wonder if we need as much of an emphasis on unlearning as we do learning. Mm. Well, I, I kind of believe the word unlearning is a bit redundant because you can't, it's not unlearning, it's, it's relearning or it's, it's learning something new, replacing what you've learned before. You, you can't really unlearn what you have. Um, and I, from my experience of working, you know, I've worked with over 160 multinational companies by now. I really feel that a lot of people have forgotten how to learn. Uh, I, I find so many times I'm, I'm trying to remind people how to learn. And you know, just as a simple example, relate, challenge, resolve, that framework, I, when I've shared it with people before in, in the training room, in coaching sessions, some people take the framework so seriously and they're like, so how, how, do, how does this part right, work? I want to get it right. And they forget that the framework is just, it's just there for inspiration. It, it's, not, it, it's, not the, it's not the path, it's a map. And you're supposed to use the map to help you find the path and walk the path by yourself, but don't take the map so seriously. <laughs> so I think a lot of people need to relearn how we actually learn. Uh, I think so many people have actually forgotten that. It's an interesting point. So Jamie, if people want to sort of connect with you and sort of learn a bit more about what you do, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, thank you. Um, they can uh, check me out on LinkedIn. Uh, you can search for Jamie Dixon and see my face on an orange background. Or you can go to shapingpaths.com where you can, you can download a free story habit story guide to learn a bit more about how to use the Relate Challenge Resolve framework. Yeah. And also they can buy your book. Yes, they can. Yes, it should be out by the time this is released. So yes, they can buy the book as well. <laughs> Great. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, please like it, subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes and share it with others so they can benefit. If you're looking to scale your business and want to talk about how to scale your business, head over to booker.com and get in touch. Jamie, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much. Remember guys, failing to learn is learning to fail. Please stay safe. And once again, Jamie, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you.